So as I, as I was saying, one of the interesting things about uh, starting to talk about spirituality more. Now, mind you, I've talked about this, I think, throughout my whole time on YouTube. But I certainly haven't focused on it. I was focusing on epistemology. You may or may not have noticed that. But uh, I did mention it. But one, one thing about really focusing on it more uh, is... Um, is, is the reactions I'm getting. For example, uh, Nick, the modern mystic, bless his heart, um, has chosen to uh, to end um, his ignorance, I mean his ignoring <clears throat> of me. And you know, that in itself is special. I did want to say one thing on that. Now he said that he stopped uh, uh, paying attention or talking to me when we were having a conversation about free will and I simply said well I do have it and that sounds like something I might say or similar to or the way you could take something I would have, have said but uh, my memory of it is more along the lines of we observe choice we flip a coin it doesn't seem to be determined it seems to follow the statistics and the statistics is pretty surreal um, it uh, comes up 50 50 and if you run a, some series of flips and it doesn't come up exactly 50 50 which it never exactly does it'll still be 50 50 after that there's some interesting patterns to the way that works and it looks like there's at least a possibility that uh, things aren't predetermined and in our own minds which is what we're actually experiencing we seem to experience a choice so I don't think much of people that say yes but I've logically deduced that it must be not free how else could it be if I can't imagine how then it must be the way I can imagine and not the way I experience and really I think there were some other things I think um, he probably wouldn't even be conscious of this, but I, I thought the, the change came when I started pointing out that, look, you live in, you know, this old uh, idyllic uh, house in, in the country of what I assume is, is the... I lost you. I was saying, and then he lives in this old idyllic house and he, in the country of what I presume is some England or some sort of place, and he grows strawberries. Uh, you know, for entertainment, and then he wants to say things are determined and nothing really matters. It's just the thinky think thinking, and I found that kind of a problem for me. I was going to say disgusting, but it's not disgusting per se. Um, but you know, it's just like I just ended up in this idyllic situation. Your fate was to die in a fire in a sweatshop in Bangladesh. What could you do? It's just, it's just things happening. I don't like that. I have a certain amount of disgust for the idea of determinism. Now, not determinists. There's a lot of determinists that they just think, well, logically, if something causes something else, how can, you know, maybe one cause, like throwing the dice, can have, you know, seven or even more results. Maybe, you know, I mean, you, you're going to logically deduce that it must be a certain way that is exactly against your observations. That's not what empirical means. That's the opposite of empirical. You're doing what Plato did. You're saying, well, I figured out in the world of forms how it has to be, so therefore, I don't buy that. Anyway, this is not, this video is not about that. This video is about the reaction that I'm getting from some people on and off about, um, you know, worrying that I'm I'm gonna I'm going crazy, you know, and it's it's related to this idea that oh you must start you now you believe in an afterlife, huh? Now you believe in spirits? No, I believe that people really are identifying uh, a kind of experience, a spiritual experience, which is associated with a, a mental a biochemical state, mental state, a feeling. Um, that we call spirituality. I'm not going to use another word because that's what we have been calling it for a long time. I think this feeling is a very powerful feeling and that it has been railroaded and co-opted and uh, diverted uh, in order to, you know, fuck with our heads in, in, in the sense of social conditioning and uh, the manufacture of consent and so on. Um, I think that our major religions um, are in general almost like plots to subvert uh, a healthy um, a healthy
healthy expression and relationship with this feeling, much like uh, the scientists at the fast food companies um, are co-opting our natural feelings of hunger into something non-nutritious when hunger is there to make sure we get nutrition. It's very analogous to me. So I thought I would repeat um, something I had said to uh, Mr. Kurt about uh, how not to go crazy as you as you listen to the spiritual feeling because I think that's a big danger I think that um, and this is a reaction I think I'm getting is people just go oh are you going crazy you're talking about this but people go crazy when they talk about it and and I agree I think it's very dangerous but I'm well able to handle that because I'm grounded by this natural philosophy now looking at natural philosophy including things in natural philosophy judged against the spiritual feeling like I have contemplated many of the things I have learned about uh, nature like momentum or you know what does entropy mean you know and I learned a lot of mathematics and I studied a, a lot of physics such that um, I, I can sort of put myself in this abstract uh, domain of ideas and uh, and see what my spiritual reaction is to it so I have found things that are acceptable uh, to my to my spiritual judgment, right? They they um, they give they seem to give me a positive and healthy spiritual reaction that are from natural philosophy, right? Because it really has to be both things. I don't trust the feeling any more than I think that's you know somebody that's having hunger and wants chocolate cake uh, that that's really going to be nutritious for them. Um, I need to triangulate on reality and um, and so I like to to see uh, what what resonates with me in terms of the big picture perspective on life um, as well as what seems uh, empirically true from looking to nature aka natural philosophy so there's I had made a list of things and it's not necessarily meant to be a complete list and that I haven't checked and checked and checked but I thought it was you know a fairly comprehensive list of things that I think that are important that I will share with you that I am also keeping in mind and have been keeping this isn't me turning over a new leaf in my life this is me turning over a new leaf in my in what I'm choosing to communicate to you. There are many aspects of my life I do not communicate to you. Things that I have mentioned that I don't communicate in the depth that I deal with them in my life. There are things I have not mentioned at all. All right, You should realize that already. I should not have to tell you that, but I will state that explicitly. So what's new here is that I'm going to focus more on conveying this sense of um, of a spirituality that I have, a very tangible, material kind of spirituality that has to do uh, uh, with psychology, you could say. There's nothing metaphysical about it. Um, it's more like psychology, and I'm taking this feeling seriously in the same way that I take my own attraction to one person and not to another seriously when choosing who I might want to pursue as a life partner. Right. Okay, one mortality. I accept mortality. If spiritual ideas that that uh, have me discard with with mortality not acceptable. I uh, you know to the degree that you know I do remain open-minded about things that that I don't believe in now like uh, certain kinds of the afterlife like your personality separates from the body and goes off. I don't believe that that doesn't make sense because I believe this is the the world of energy that we're living in right now is the spiritual world whatever that means so I, I accept the mortality of myself and my spirit um, I don't think it detaches or separate I'm not a dualist right so um, even if I was open-minded to something like that it, it's like uh, it's still mortal it would have an impact on the definition of mortal you know it would have to do with well you know, like we don't remember past lives, uh, even though, you know, my grandmother went to past life regression 
you know, hypnosis, and it was pretty amazing. I mean, I heard the tapes of it, but, you know, to me, that's a psychological phenomena, and it wouldn't, and even if she was really remembering something from, from someone else's life, I mean, for all I know, that could be encoded in the DNA and come out, right? It wouldn't mean we're not mortal. And, um, and remember, I'm not talking just about reality. I'm talking about things that help you not go crazy. So accepting mortality, very important to me. If you want to uh, investigate, uh, uh, to explore, trusting your spiritual feeling more, I think you have to believe in mortality if you, you don't even want to keep a level head about it. Um, there's probably a better term, but another thing is representationalism. And this is the same thing as saying there's nothing direct. You don't, don't try to plug into direct knowledge. Yes, you can narrow the gap but, um, between your representation and the thing being represented. You can get more and more accurate, arbitrarily close, but do not think you're getting direct knowledge. When you... Uh, model a system, when you come up with an idea in your head of a system, of how any system works, a system could be a part of your body, the system of my hand, or a system out there, weather, or or projectiles. It's all representationalism. You do not get a, 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 the idea of a system that is exactly the same as the thing it's representing, because they're two separate things. So they can have a relationship. And, but the relationship is never identity. And indeed, I would even add to that, the fact that things are always changing, nothing actually stands still. This is something we've, we've seen in physics. We've, you know, are things more like motion and energy, or are they, they, they more like things that just sit there and, and stay what they are? No, everything's changing, everything's moving, right? So from one moment to the next, a thing is not even identical to itself. So the relationship between you and yourself is not even the identity relationship. You could say, well, what if you freeze time? You can't freeze time. So, no two things have the identity relationship, and no one thing has the identity relationship with itself over time. Okay, representationalism, just accept it. There's all, every, every message comes through a conduit. Every conduit transforms the message, at least a little. You could call it distortion, but that's, even that is kind of a bias against the fact that this is just how information goes. It travels along, and it changes as it travels. You know, and to the degree you want to picture something like a photon being emitted and staying as itself, uh, and, and and then let's say being absorbed and it wasn't transformed all along the way well it is through relativity through the velocities you know and the fact is there will be an intervening medium oh but that single photon didn't get absorbed by that medium when you receive it and process that information even if it's just one step it will be transformed in that one step and in our human minds we're not dealing with that level of fidelity and there's obviously a shit ton of interpretation going on right there is a an object we would call it out there some sort of a system that is uh, consistent enough on our time scales that it seems to be steady and light is bouncing off of it little bits of information are coming to our eyes little bits of information to our ears and so on and we recompile that into an object that's a lot of interpretation okay and in that is uh, an indirectness representationalism right it doesn't matter how accurate how realistic rather a painting you paint of a horse a painting is not a horse all right um, uh, relativity. I believe that it's important to realize that what we really see are relationships between things and possibly you could consider a photon as a relationship between the emitter and the absorber and um, I think this helps uh, this is related to the to the representationalism and it helps um, somebody went to remember that when, if they're following a spiritual path that that's 
your relationship with your own environment. You can't say, and therefore this is what you should do. Like, I look at the half moon, I get a spiritual feeling, therefore the half moon is spiritual. You should look at the half moon. No, the spiritual experience comes from my relationship to that image, not from your relationship to it. All right. So um, it, 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 in, there's a lot of reasons to believe in relativity, you know, in, in science and natural philosophy. But in terms of uh, remaining sane while you, you take your spiritual feeling seriously, it, it has to do with um, keeping in mind the complexity of trying to generalize from your own experiences to the experiences of others. So, you know, for example, I see a lot of people in the, in the spirituality, and especially in popular spirituality, where trading money uh, comes into play. People um, are looking for systems. It's like they want a spirituality that's like uh, the directions for assembling a piece of IKEA furniture. You know, when you do this, when you do that, you know, three, question mark, four, enlightened. And, um, I see what I'm presenting here more like a spiritual a theory, right? And um, about you know what this feeling might mean, and and basing it on an empiricism of where you're supposed to experience it for yourself and do some statistical analysis, for lack of a better word, on your own experiences. Right? Not other people's experiences, and certainly not taking the results of their experiences, their spiritual system, but really a methodology, right? A, a theory about a methodology where you can ask the question yourself with no guarantee of getting a coherent answer, right? Because you're going to have to interpret those experiences, and, and there's, you're going to be representing your experiences, and there is indirection there, all right? Um, the principle of deconstruction. You can, um, you can come up with a concept of space and be 100% sure, yeah, space, that's real. And you still have the issue of, well, what about polar coordinates? What about uh, versus Cartesian coordinates versus, you know, hyperbolic coordinates? versus not having a coordinate system. And even within coordinate systems, you have the zero point, which is like an illusion. You know, neutral, zero in a Cartesian. But I can move it anywhere. It's arbitrary where the origin goes in a Cartesian coordinate system. Deconstruction. How you deconstruct things. You know, for example, individuals, you know, have reason to put the origin point you know, at their own location. It simplifies certain calculations to have a convenient origin point like that, but obviously that doesn't make that origin point fundamental. For one, it, it would be moving around with you, or maybe the origin point is at your home. On the big island of Hawaii, you know, have you have a road that goes all the way around the island, and it's actually named two, it's two highways, and they both have their zero marker, at Ken's House of Pancakes, or as I like to call it, Ken's House of Pancakes. That's a good place for the origin point, but it's hardly fundamental. And it depends on your deconstruction of reality where you choose to put uh, the origin points and which coordinate systems you choose to use or to not use. Right? Um, now finally we get to, to things that, that um, well, you know, they're my, my own personal, they're after years of thinking about things this way um, and with, you know, these other uh, grounding ideas, um, I think they sort of wrap them up. And uh, that is embodied cognition. The mind is a body. It's a mortal thing, right? It, it, it radiates heat. You know, it has fuzzy boundaries. You don't have a single identity. You're actually a colony of eukaryotic cells. It's embodied cognition. The mind is a body, right? It's, a, it's an organ of the body at the very least in the brain, and really it stretches out. You know, light comes from far away and directly impacts in the neural system, so maybe the mind could stretch out there. 
doesn't change the fact your mind is a body and it is developed to it, from an evolutionary process in order to survive what has mattered to the mind over time is uh, is survival and the quality of its perceptions generally relate to survival right and so uh, um, you sh this is that's why I'm saying this is recapitulating the mortality of it, the fact that it relies on um, uh, representationalism. There are no cheat codes, right? You're just a body moving around. You're one thing. You lose heat. There's no perpetual motion except for through, uh, you know, the digestive process where you take in energy. There's no, no free lunch and this sort of thing, you know. And that's a beautiful thing because this is the spiritual world. Why? Because it is mortal embodied things that are having this spiritual emotion. Whatever it means, good or bad, illusion or not, fundamental feeling or recipe of feelings, it's something a body is experiencing. A mortal, real, physical body. Okay. And, um, and then the final thing is that I think we are left with uh, uh, a version of of not, of experience that's all about information theory. What is survival? That you're still getting information, right? What is um, uh, what is chance? Is a, a statistical analysis, a probability, right? So um, yeah, so that's that. All right. Good night. It's two thirty in the morning. Just to finish programming about. Uh, I guess, well, 40 minutes ago, played a video game and then made this video for you. And, and for myself, I guess. <laughs>